Angeles, and this year is this year also visiting a Wissenschaft colleague, Zubeli. I'm not good in German, but uh, yeah, no. And uh, he is uh, a historian of the sciences, I would say. Uh, and uh, uh, we say that you are researching currently the history of human heredity, uh, and more particularly how insane asylums and related institutions became important sites for record keeping on conditions regarded as hereditary and for the sales from their presumed inheritance. As I said before, I personally have come across uh, Professor Porter's work through his book, Trust in Numbers, which is uh, really a very, very profound work on the history of quantification, and the, as the subtitle says, the quest of politics is in the Western world. Uh, he's also very well known for his book, uh, The Rise of Statistical Thinking. Uh, Professor Porter graduated from Stanford University with an A.B. in history, and he got his PhD from Princeton University. It all looks so good. So, uh, uh, I will stop here and give open the floor to you. Very good. Uh, uh, Thanks very much, Cornelia. Uh, Do you have slides? Uh, there are some slides. They're not too wonderful. <laughs> Uh, while, while they're uh, getting the slides ready, I would uh, uh, comment that I have been engaged in studying the way people use numbers and information. And now uh, data, which is a word that still uh, uh, causes a little, faced with the task of discussing data, I wasn't exactly sure what it was or what it isn't. And uh, after this conference, I might be prepared to give the talk that I'm doing now. <laughs> I, um, have been engaged all these years with uh, looking at the history of numbers and statistics and data. It's a kind of a meta, you know, that as I you know, parasitical on all the all the statistics and data, I can uh, discuss their social and historical aspects. But uh, so there's data, and then we do metadata. But um, and now we're being recorded and put online, so we become data again. So the data we become, uh, that data becomes meta meta. Data. So I feel now as I'm firmly lodged in the middle of the data enterprise rather than outside looking in. And I guess that is true, that is part of the allure of big data that, that such a thing has happened to us. Yanis, can we do something about the lighting so we can see the yeah, slides? Let's, okay. let's see. Well, okay. yeah. Yeah. Also, no, I can try the microphone as well because you can on the slides. Is it better? Yeah. 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 No, right. Number three. Oh. <laughs> this is a very modern. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Because they do something like this, it's like a smooth thing. I'm giving away. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, so I, uh, I will pour you with uh, overheated exclamations on the uh, excitement of big data. The world of data constitutes an exception to the usual rule that what is fascinating in that individual form turns to boredom when repeated, multiplied, grouped together, and averaged. The data as we understand it, uh, or is that data as we understand them, is a humdrum by itself and turns char charismatic as a result of limitless repetition. Uh, this characteristic it shares with uh, money, which uh, functions merely to buy things we need or want until it is amassed. We may even suspect in the age of Google and its allies and competitors that the charisma of data is mainly composed of the charisma of money. Data in many of its forms has become fully fungible, as you know, including so much that internet companies gather up from all our daily activities. If you're not paying for it, you're the product being sold, as they say. An up-to-date marks might uh, characterize the contemporary public as uh, units 
of a homogeneous mass of targetable purchasing power. From this, we make the public sphere. Well, it isn't quite that the units are intrinsically boring, of course. The listing of all the purchases someone has made uh, and the websites they have visited with texts and emails and tweets they have uh, sent and received could definitely add spice, or shall we say, embarrassment to a little biography. It seems that sex crimes these days are most often solved when the perpetrators cannot resist posting videos of themselves at the moment of criminal glory. But in contrast to the files of the East German Stasi, or for that matter, of a credit report from the 1950s used to assess someone's suitability for a life insurance policy, the data that thrilled the advertiser will, in most cases, never be observed by human eye. They're, like, uh, they're not intrinsically homogeneous and boring, but are made so by the modes of analysis applied to them, but which are fully automated and computerized. They're not tainted by anything we would call understanding or meaning. I think of the X-ray scanning devices deployed now in US airports, I think not here, that cut through clothing through our nakedness, but never generate an image. We find the body inside the clothes interesting enough, often attractive, sometimes mesmerizing, but the inspection becomes tolerable only by being made oblivious to our beauty and our shame. It is in a way paradoxical that boringness, or rather the illusion of boringness, is so basic to the allure of big data. My linking of data with money making, though valid enough, is of course not the whole story. Another axis of planet data is uh, science. Philosophers and scientists who treat drink beating from this work often suppose that science means hypothetical deductive. George Castle has just uh, uh, proposed this, uh, this issue. Is that science means hypothetical deductive reasoning, or testing and falsification, or experimentation and mathematical reason. But while, but while all of these are important, science is a much wider endeavor, and the production and circulation of data is among the most important features of science, not just in the 21st century, but going back to the Alphonsine tables used by medieval astronomers and astrologers and even further. Well, let us add one more dimension uh, to uh, uh, money, uh, er, economy, and, uh, and, uh, and science, uh, the state, or perhaps I should say governance, and we are up to three dimensions, which may be enough for the moment. Much of what concerns us today can be plotted into this space. The ideal of the neutrality of numbers and of facts that grew up as a political one, or maybe we should say a counter-political uh, one. Even, I would say, especially when the numbers are about the state. If data are what is a given, as the etymology suggests, then they are always out there waiting to be gathered. We idealize ourselves as standing passively before the world of data, this data automaton. By contrast, the facts that etymologically are made things. And while nobody remembers this, the data seem even more than facts to stand, up, stand apart from our own activity. I would not go so far as to claim that uh, science wants always to deny its own activity as a creative endeavor, but it uses this trope of hard facts, data, and evidence often enough in the uh, difficult effort to maintain a union of passivity uh, and genius. Uh, natural science is often contrasted to humanistic fields uh, in these terms. The Nobel physicist uh, Steven Weinberg once invoked the words of an unnamed colleague who, as he lay dying, claimed the consolation, he said, at least of never again having to look up the word hermeneutics in a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> hermeneutics is basically just interpretation, not a thing that scientists, any more than the rest of us, can do without. Modern business positions itself in a similar way to science. On the one hand, as a place of evidence where those who will not submit to the force of the data must be done in by market forces, and at the same time as sustained by the unquenchable dreams of heroic entrepreneurs. A statistics whose etymology points to empirical knowledge about states that was in the 19th century a version of social science. Like political economy and unlike sociology, it was already a recognized field of knowledge. I think of it as the original social science. Statistics aim to reveal through accumulation of numbers the facts about society. 
the Statistical Society of London, established in 1834, took as its emblem a sheaf of wheat with the motto, alias Exterendum, to be threshed out by others. I uh, well, just noticed that actually I have the, uh, the old and the new and emblems, and they took out that to be threshed out by others uh, for the, to, to bring it up to date. So they were embarrassed by this claim that it could be made automatic, that they should not have to be able to express <coughs> opinions in their work. Anyhow, but in 1834, to avoid political dissension, they resolved to limit their deliberations to matters of fact and to keep out opinion. Their idea was that the facts should speak for themselves. Autonomous information already. This wariness in regard to theory uh, provides a rationale for social scientists writing the history of their own disciplines to leave statistics, I mean the field of really, actually the, most of the, the whole empirical world of statistics out of that history. Most of them favor a more strongly theoretical orientation, and on that basis, they reason that the administrative reformist field of statistics was not a real social science. There's a whole literature about British sociology in the late 19th century, taking in some founders of the LSE, which, which separates them from real theoretical sociology in France and, uh, and, and Germany. Whether, uh, whether this was or wasn't social science doesn't really matter here. I will insist that the statistical or quantitative traditions of research on matters of human science have their own character and, her, and integrity, but this has been true for a long time. I mean that they have never been subordinated to theoretical positions. You know, they have had a fundamental role in linking social, economic, and political knowledge to all kinds of practical efforts to reform, regulate, and administer. And while I don't suppose you can easily find ac credible academics or even journalists saying that the numbers simply speak for themselves, you can easily turn up an abundance of econometric, sociological, and political studies that simply tap into a database as a warehouse of numbers and facts, as if there were no need to open up this black box to evaluate and criticize the data contained there, as if the data were, were autonomous. The temptation to use numbers to convey a false sense of simplicity is especially strong when they are being served up to the public. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's uh, social contract offered an easy indicator of good government. The government under which the citizens do most increase and multiply, he said, is infallibly the best. Similarly, the government in which a people diminishes in number and wastes away is the worst. Experts in calculation, I leave it to you to count, to number, to compare. Well, in fact, he did not quite make population growth an indicator. He claimed something more. He said, infallible. And yet there was a little problem with treating population even as an indicator in Rousseau's day. Nobody was quite sure in 1762 whether the population of European countries was increasing or not. There was a move in English, England about this time to establish a census, which was delayed in part because of official fears that it might show a declining population and discredit the government. It was, a, it was common, in fact, to turn the reasoning around, since we don't have a census, but we do know we are badly governed, therefore the population must be declining. <laughs> in our own time, the economy reigns supreme as the indicator of prosperity and good government. We have infinite measures of economic growth, of business prosperity, of job numbers and unemployment rates, and the cost of living or the value of the currency. But Ronald Reagan, who is not exactly Rousseau, clobbered Jimmy Carter with his famous misery index, inflation plus unemployment, as a proper basis for deciding how to vote in the 1980 election. A more uh, 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 I'm tempted to say, uh, sorry, um, since the Second World War, national, especially international policy, has fo focused overwhelmingly on GDP. I'm tempted to say it has brooked no rival, but uh, we used to talk about GNP, so there are some little intermittencies. The more interesting problem for the historian is that we hardly knew what an economy was, even spoke of an economy, until through the effort to mobilize product productive activity to fight the last world war, around uh, 1940, governments cultivated a wide-ranging system of economic measurement from which GDP or GNP could be calculated. 
after the war, GDP was mobilized for campaigns of international development to try to measure the effects of development in the third world, the developing world, the global south, or whatever it should be called. There was always a lot of productive as well as deleterious activity that was not included. What about household labor, typically by women? What about harms to the environment or the mitigation of these harms? The sorts of the countries to which aid was directed were especially hard to measure because much work in exchange was not monetized in the same way. Yet, measure we must. The, the use of measurement to judge the success of all uh, kinds of remedies and interventions goes back centuries. As always, the measures grew up along with the functions they were supposed to serve. Uh, medicine, for example, has uh, been a much measured profession since about 1700. Long before there was a GDT, there were estimates of the duration of life, partly, but not only, for Rousseau's sorts of reasons. Here is a Daniel Bernoulli's calculation of the effect on population of inoculation against smallpox, or rather, if uh, systematic inoculation were applied against uh, smallpox. Rousseau was even placed on this target, partly his own, when he revealed in his confessions that he and his partner, Tevez, deposited five babies in succession at a foundling hospital. Orphanages were important early sites of medical calculation. Using the median measure, which was then generally favored for this purpose, the age by which half of the children had died in such institutions, and the institution where Rousseau put his own babies, that was, uh, was uh, so typically less than five. The expansion of life insurance stimulated the development of the life table. These show how a round number, like 100,000 uh, newborns, will be reduced by death each year up to age, well actually here, I say 90 or 100, but here it goes to age 103. For a long time they had very little data, except on the sorts of people who purchased insurance contracts. But there were more and more of these. A new industry gave rise to the numbers it needed, which then found a wider, shall we say, scientific expression. Well, as Yann uh, has mentioned, it, uh, I have uh, recently been studying insane asylums, mainly how they recorded and studied human heredity, but uh, also at the medical side. These institutions took off in the early 19th century, you may know that, and they were rich sites of statistics. I mean, every, public, every public medical institution was a site of statistics much more than the private practice of medicine. The most ubiquitous table, I don't know if you can see that, the most ubiquitous table uh, recorded what was called population movement, actually taking over an implausible word in English, but it was in the French called the mouvement de population. The number of patients at the beginning of the, of the year, the number admitted during the year, and the number <coughs> as, as cured or improved or unimproved or who died, and finally the number remaining. Numbers or percentages of cures and deaths that were the most crucial ones in reports sent to government ministries and often circulated to an interested public, which should be convinced that, that the asylums were important and valuable institutions. Throughout, there was much interest in reducing the table to a single number. For example, a cure rate. When things were going well, this cure rate looked like the simple answer to an obvious question. Were these insane asylums providing something valuable? At least one English asylum and several American ones boasted cure rates over 90% for some years between 1820 and 1940. By the way, you will only the highest figure you will find here, which is it's an American uh, set of tables, uh, and an American institution up there is up to 88.66. I think that's 22 for no 18 out of 19 or something. So it's kind of a, it's a funny thing to make a percentage out of. Um, Oh, but again, it's so, you know, using the table as propaganda, our new institutions in America are as good or better as the great, uh, you know, old world institutions. So, so anyhow, the, the, the cure rate of almost, uh, almost and sometimes above 90%, on this basis it seemed like an open and shut case that these were eminently useful institutions. But, 90% of what, you might ask? <coughs> the whole asylum population? That would hardly be fair, since some who did not recover the first year will recover later. Or 90% of the discharged patients that year, but then patients who remain in the asylum for years and never recover will not be counted at all. 
because they'll never be discharged. It quickly became clear that there is no really satisfactory solution, <coughs> though this number continued to be reported for, uh, for decades. And another problem, some insane, the doctor said, had been disabled for so long that there was no real prospect of helping them, no reason to admit them to a curative institution at all. It would hardly be required to require, fair to require the asylums to cure incurable patients. How do you know if they're incurable? Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they could work much more effectively, they said, if they were allowed to make their own admission decisions rather than having to take on as patients uh, uh, sent, take, take on as patients the people sent arbitrarily and perhaps inappropriately by a mayor or judge who paid little heed to the medical considerations but simply acted to get a dangerous lunatic off the street. The proper calculation of the value of asylum treatment, they said, was not its actual record but what it was capable of achieving with the right kind of patients. The superintendents did not hesitate to adopt the currency of government and administration in defending the value of their institutions. That currency was, as ever, money. To this end, they introduced a rudimentary analysis of costs and benefits. A stay in, cura in a curative asylum is expensive, to be sure, but with any reasonable cure rate, the savings greatly outweigh the cost to society of maintaining these sick paupers for the rest of their lives. And there are an infinity of calculations that showing the value of the asylum from this strictly tax-paying uh, standpoint. These appear to be compelling arguments, yet the calculations also seem a bit slick. And the results of treatment were more and more disappointing. Despite the progress of knowledge, they said, uh, on which, uh, uh, of medicine, on which the, doc they, the doctors always insisted, the cure rates after this glorious uh, beginning uh, started declining and continued to go down throughout the 19th century and beyond. While the numbers of insane, including those in the institutions, rose and rose, not just absolutely, but in proportion to the population and by a, uh, almost an order of magnitude over the 19th and early 20th century. And so the asylums, which were real pathbreakers in the applications of statistics to medicine, were pioneers also of critiques of calculation. The critics never gained the upper hand, and most continued, by choice or necessity, to produce reams of numbers, even while doubting them. But there were eloquent skeptics. I'll be content here to quote a, a bit from the American Isaac Ray, writing in 1849, that's very early in the skeptical uh, tradition, from the Butler Institution in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. So no question is more important for the uh, public reputation of asylums than curability, he pointed out. <laughs> so the asylums all report the, 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 all, re, all, all report the number of their recoveries. But these are affected by every characteristic of the patients, who may be prosperous or impoverished, strong and healthy, or foreigners, he says, foreigners worn down by hardship and exposure. Even a death rate is for this reason hard to interpret. He means that it depends on what kind of patients come into the asylum. So, may not be a way of judging the, the institution. Ray argued that implicit faith in statistics was only for the naive. I would mention here that asylum superintendents were not so naive. They knew perfectly well that if a prisoner in a prison or courthouse could convince a judge to transfer a disturbed, dying patient to their asylum, they would in one blow uh, load down mortality statistics with a death and the treatment statistics with a failure to cure. What Ray called the strictly inductive method should not be celebrated but challenged, since it is this assumption that gets us in trouble. Now I quote him, it would seem as if results like these uh, statistical compilations could not be otherwise than correct, because they are but the general expression of the facts themselves. It is this very appearance of certainty that which sometimes, as in the present case, blinds us to the actual fallacy, and we go on accumulating he says, and hugging our treasures of knowledge, as we fancy them, until we find at last that we have been ingeniously deceiving ourselves with an empty show while the substance has completely escaped us. The Ray turned this presumption of straightforward factuality on its head. Um, 
emphasizing the subtlety of mind required to draw valid conclusions from numbers. Its materials, the data, will be copious, but they must also be carefully selected with a close regard to their fitness for the purpose at hand, he said. And then he said, this is no mere arithmetic, he went on, but subtle philosophical analysis, requiring acute discrimination of materials as challenging for adult Ketele statistics, Ketele from the mid 19th century, as, uh, of, as, uh, as for Isaac Newton's celestial mechanics, that two centuries or a century and a half earlier. Failure to recognize the demands of statistics, as in the notorious, the notorious 1840 US Census, that had allowed great shows of accuracy to disguise singularly barren results. This is still Isaac Ray's uh, expression here. That, notor that notorious census had recorded an unprecedented rate of insanity among free blacks in northern states, with the highest of all in Ray's former home in Maine, and was uh, gratefully interpreted, interpreted in the slave south as evidence that Africans could not stand up to the stresses of freedom on a civilized continent and actually also how, about how difficult uh, life in, in the North was for anybody's uh, sanity. <laughs> it had also been uh, clearly, uh, the this, this census result had been clearly discredited, and I'll just say why, why was the, the, the one in 14 free blacks in Maine were, were, were uh, alleged to be insane, and why was this ratio, ratio so high in Maine? Because there were so few blacks in Maine that the little, uh, the little error on this big complicated form uh, only needed to record a few uh, uh, insane blacks to drive to drive this rate to uh, an absurd uh, level. So you know, as actually as as was shown at the time, it was all, it had been clearly discredited already. But the champions of slavery preferred to put their confidence in the raw numbers. <clears throat> it is a very common saying, says Isaac Ray, that figures will not lie. But it is very certain that in the hands of the ignorant, the careless, the undiscriminating, undiscriminating, they may become most potent instruments of falsehood. And in regard to the assigned causes of insanity, who really rises above this ignorance? We must wonder, I finish with Ray here, whether our studies have led us to a higher philosophy than that which consists in repeating catchwords and echoing the popular voice. While these old asylums never filled terabytes uh, the way our modern websites do, they were sites of unmanageably big data in their own time. They are fully in line with the other uh, most important <coughs> sites of data collection in the 19th and most of the 20th century. The silence and hospitals kept records of the work they were charged to do. So what, 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 where did the record, where, where did the data come from? Did they come from the processes of work and the recording required to, to do that, that work. They dealt, in fact, in two currencies. The one was financial. As public institutions, they were supposed to keep accounts so they could justify their expenditures. The officers of the institutions should not divert funds to private use, and they should be able to show what they paid for buildings, supplies, security, and medical care to show that these were reasonable. The second unit of account was the patient. First money, second medicine. The hospital should keep a medical history for the sake of those who would treat these patients in the future, and perhaps also to get an idea of what treatments work, and to show you were getting something for this money, namely cures. I have to add that there are few signs of a trying to adapt medical care in any systematic way to the statistical evidence of past experience. That is, that was the one thing they did not want to record was the relation between treatment regimes and, and recoveries. Um, um, they were more assiduous about recording the causes of insanity. You can see that that's the, about hereditary causes. This was often a hodgepodge, and I think it was the main thing that Isaac Ray was thinking of when he said physicians were merely echoing the public voice. Um, after all, since causes could not be witnessed within the asylum, the records depended mainly on what the patient or family members told an asylum official at the time of admission. Hereditary causes, interestingly, were a partial exception since the evidence was often medical coming down to whether some ancestor or collateral relative had been diagnosed as insane or in some other way mentally disturbed, and often actually whether they had been, but their ancestors had been in the very same hospital, in which case the hospital maintained those records. But to re reiterate the point, asylums and hospitals, like so many state bureaucracies, 
and private firms and households as well generally kept records of their activities in the course of carrying out those activities. It is like a customs agency which charges duties on imports and keeps records both of the merchandise coming in and the tariffs charged. Criminal statistics are generated in the course of police work and of courtroom trials. Income statistics come often from tax records. Unemployment figures, at least in part, from claims filed and periodic checks sent out. Education is paid chiefly by schools, health and disease, by clinics and hospitals, and on and on. The census is a shining exception at gathering uh, statistics for specifically informational purposes rather than to administer the program. But it is its program is the gathering of the numbers. It is in some ways more like a scientific organization than an administrative one, and it keeps a staff of demographers, statisticians, and social scientists. Some economic statistics are also gathered for specifically informational purposes, often by highly credentialed economists and statisticians. Measures of inflation or the cost of living are prominent in this category. We will notice that some of what I call administrative has also a purely information gathering side. All these causes of insanity were scarcely necessary to keep the asylum running. That is, they showed the public health ambitions and the scientific ambitions of even of these uh, insane asylums. All these causes of insanity, as I say, were scarcely necessary to keep the asylum running. So the information was typically collected at the point of admission, along with information about age, place of residence, medical history, family status, and who will pay the expenses. That is information that was required for, for the normal running of the asylum. There are always, of course, questions to be asked about the accuracy and even the meaning of data. Scientific purposes and scientific credentials do not lift data out of the world of human intentions and imperfections. But the integration of data with administration brings in a special set of problems. The International Statistical Congresses, initiated by Adolf Kettle in 1853, quickly ran up against these problems when they took up the topic of a statistical harmonization or standardization. I'm just going to say a few words about that and not, for instance, about European standardization, which is a fascinating topic with some of the same aspects, though with a, a, a bit more international power, or actually considerably more international power uh, 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 standing behind uh, the standardizing efforts. So in 1853, the statistics of crime gives a sense of the issues. First, there is no uniformity of legal definitions. Like the death rates mentioned by Isaac Ray, murder is not so clear in practice as it seems. The category of manslaughter takes in all kinds of mitigating circumstances, and not the same in different countries, including intention, provocation, and even sanity. Mere statisticians have no authority to meddle with legal definitions. We can imagine a small army of coders going back through case records to try to code them according to an international standard, but they would find different, different kinds of information in the records of different jurisdictions. They would encounter reclassifications. Plea bargaining, a fact of life in much of the world, may involve negotiations about the criminal charge, and not only about the sentence. It reminds us of the, of the measures that with which people paid their duties to wards a century before that, where they, uh, where the social power was expressed not as changing the, uh, the amounts, but changing the measures. If you were a subordinate, you paid in the heat of pushing. Put aside the fine points, murder usually involves a body, or at least a disappearance. In countries with a reasonable standard of public order, most murders will be somehow reported. You cannot always distinguish murder from accidents or from suicide, but all of these are likely to be registered, so it is possible to come up with reasonably reliable figures without depending too much on the findings of police and courts and the specific uh, definitions. Almost no other category of crime allows this. An assault, a theft, a burglary is likely to be known, unlikely to be known unless reported. There are various temptations, including insurance and marital discord, to report events that never happened. In other cases, people will find no advantage in reporting what did happen, especially if they don't expect their local police to take action, or if they expect the police to, uh, to harass them instead. The police may persuade the victim to report the crimes as something less serious than was originally intended. This is totally normal in our modern, uh, in our modern uh, policing uh, statistics, in fact. 
Policing by the numbers has had the inevitable effect of corrupting the numbers. If there are any laws of social behavior to be had in this world, one of them is surely that when numbers are turned to incentives, they will be gained and corrupted. Now, the various names have been attached to this principle. I like Donald Campbell's claim, but the social uh, the, the psychologist, the champion of numbers and skeptic of numbers. But there is never a clear point of beginning for an idea like this one. And mind you, DDA's uh, DDA is an excellent, my colleague at the, uh, at the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin, is an excellent source for the consequences of numbers-based policing. The wonderful American uh, HBO television series, The Wire, that though fictional is another, or perhaps because fictional. Good policing should lower crime rates, but truly bad policing can also lower the official rates if people don't report the crimes. You will be aware that it is also possible to estimate crime using survey methods, so there is never just one way to do it. The modern era of big data has, almost, has inspired almost utopian visions of what might be achieved by constant real-time monitoring and recording. The US government decreed uh, computerized record keeping uh, of, uh, for, for medicine with this goal in mind, that a vast reservoir of data on treatments and outcomes would suddenly be made accessible and would lead to important discoveries regarding the effectiveness of treatments or at least subtle improvements. So this is a bit like uh, 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 George Gaskell's uh, you know, uh, phylogenetic record, which should perhaps emerge automatically from the, from the recording and compilation of, and, uh, you know, and, and analysis of the data. There's a longer tradition of trying to rate hospitals and even doctors based on outcomes. That certainly happens in this country. It's a very tricky business because there is no reason to assume and much reason to doubt that patients in the different institutions are sufficiently homogeneous to support a quantitative comparison. As in the 19th century asylums, doctors will want to avoid the least healthy patients or will begin using classifications of severity to mitigate the statistical damage with which they are threatened when they do get the worst patients. As there should be, as they, as there, I mean, as, as there, there should be such, uh, such uh, classifications, but where can it end? There will be standards of severity, rules for applying the standards, clarifications of the rules, unannounced inspections, persecutions for notifying physicians confidentially in advance of these inspections, and so on. If you're an academic, you have perhaps have seen the scientometric data that Google keeps on us, which in a way is harmless enough and beyond harmless, even informative. A list of publications with a citation count for each paper, the power to learn more about each of these by clicking on down to finer levels. This is evidence anyone might think it is important or even indispensable to have in trying to assess the position and significance of someone else's work and of our own. Google also gives the H index. Uh, probably you've all seen this for yourself, so but maybe not. Put yourself in, and there it is, your H index, as well as all your, their measure of your citation counts. Which, let us be clear, performs this service of reducing this array of numbers. This is the service it performs, reducing an array of numbers to one single number. In the dark ages, maybe a decade ago, the quantifying dean might have wanted to know the number of legitimate publications, perhaps peer-reviewed ones, and the number of citations. The H index reduces this to one number. If you are, well, I say 12th most cited uh, publication has 12 citations. This graph, I think it's the, uh, it's, uh, one, two, three, four, the fifth most cited publication. It actually has more than five, but it has six. Has not, but the next one has fewer. Anyhow, um, as a, if your 12th most cited publication has 12 citations, then 12 is your number. It takes at least 144 citations to get an H index of 12. And on this basis, my own H index picks up about 7% of my citations. I have a lot of citations for trusting numbers. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> right. But uh, its inappropriateness to those disciplines that emphasize book writing is, in fact, well recognized. Still, I can't think of an advantage to compensate for its many radical disadvantages. A recent defense offers praise for its insensitivity to missing data, the insensitivity of the record to missing data. But that is because it is insens insensitive to all data. <laughs> it is vulnerable to gaming of many sorts. 
the defenders, well, I, 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 I'll just mention one, but the defenders use the insensitivity argument to suggest that it cannot be easily gained, since self-citations will usually have no effect. Though when they do have an effect, they have a very big effect. <laughs> um, um, I speculated to a, to a friend that people would focus self-citation on the publication where it makes a difference. The publication's right there. <coughs> um, here are the sixth and seventh top publication. Oh, she said, my husband, he's a chemist, already does that. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether to be proud or disappointed. My discovery, anyhow, in a, in a fast-moving world animated by self-interest, it would be bold indeed to suppose that one's productions, one's predictions, and my prediction, can keep up with reality. It is like finance, where the first sign of a new trick uh, to increase pure trading profits is that some odd new patterns show up on the markets. You discover the phenomenon, which they're not talking about. You don't discover the principle. If you discover the principle, you are an investor. And the people, inevitably, the people who discover how to manipulate their citations are worried about their H index. So, I don't suppose anyone here needs to be reminded. And historians actually don't even know what it is closely, so that's it. <laughs> I don't suppose anyone here needs to be reminded of how loan officers and really all sorts of people in all sorts of corporations were to take credit for profits that depended on optimistic assumptions, for example, that all the loan payments would be made for the next 30 years, and took their bonus for origination of these loans in the first year. <laughs> Once they can get away with that, then the riskier the loan, the better, since the riskier one carries a higher interest rate. The deceit involved in such bonus calculations is too obvious to mention. Low-hanging fruit for a trade of the banks. I suppose it kept happening because a portion of those paper profits was credited to people all along, all, all the way up the line to the CEO, the same way that Mexican presidents used to go out of business so, so uh, as such rich people and move to Switzerland, uh, where the money already was. So no one wanted to say what the, what the emperor was wearing. But I'll give as my final example an issue of teachers and schools. It's a very particular, every, every country has its own problems. I'm sorry to say that I know the US ones best, so I'll just mostly uh, mention that. This one pertains to US schools. Mostly, however, it's, a, it's a protect, perhaps especially crucial there because the curriculum is so variable, unstandardized, at, at most standardized at the level of the state, and often not even at, at that level. So, Serious, well-meaning people are looking for tests to measure or indicate student learning. Very reasonable to do. The simplest thing would be to test the skills of students and compare the results for different teachers. But of course, this is not fair. The students were not equal coming in. And, uh, uh, and so there's grown up a, a dream of a perfect system of evaluation, the great educational, uh, our American educational database, the evaluation not of the students, but of the teachers in terms of value added. But what were the student scores at the beginning of the year, and how much will their scores improve under, under teacher X this year? The best teachers are those who have the most value, under whom the scores increase the most. We can readily produce a very considerable database, which computers, of course, can now easily handle. Such a system certainly has its appeal, especially if we believe that the schools are currently failing. The principals or headmasters have been reluctant to take responsibility. Even a very conscientious principal would like to maintain some, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, authority, but also would like some data before going out on a limb by criticizing a teacher's teaching, still more before holding back a pay increase or discharging the teacher. Nobody denies that the implementation of a system of measurement involves many technical problems. And perhaps in most cases, they, these are, are contingent, these are, there are competent and well-meaning people trying to solve the technical problems. There certainly are such people. An obvious and not very technical problem is that it is extremely hard to write a test for a highly unstandardized curriculum. <laughs> this leads to a, a reversal of the sort I have already mentioned. The supposed urgency of testing has pushed the schools towards a more standard curriculum. Really, it is hard to avoid making the tests into part of the curriculum. Otherwise, if the students uh, know that their test results do not matter for them, they don't try very hard. The schools have had to sponsor great campaigns of school pride to try to motivate the students to do their best. 
They also find ways to get poor students to stay home. <coughs> so quite unexpectedly, we find a bit of gaming. But the worst thing of all uh, may be that the tests do not examine a set curriculum. They dictate a curriculum. That is the standardization which Americans refused to do for so many years uh, as a planned enterprise finally comes about through the very testing process uh, that uh, was applied uh, <coughs> that, that, that was applied to them, that became necessary because it wasn't sufficiently uh, standard. The tests uh, don't just examine a set curriculum, they dictate it. Uh, is, it, it. The course of study must first of all be, so that a course of study must first of all be suited uh, to objective machine scorable testing, which we already did a lot of, to be sure. <coughs> this means excluding as much as possible of the subtlety that inevitably shows up as ambiguity and need for interpretation, so hermeneutics again. We may recall the famous line of President George W. Bush, my hero, which we often recall when reflecting on his invasion of Iraq, I don't do nuance. <laughs> Alternative version in Texas, we don't do nuance. <laughs> Perhaps it is time to declare a national crisis of interpretation, a national crisis of subtlety, a national crisis of irony. In England, you ask? <laughs> well, I don't know. In the public schools or state schools, these problems, I think, are much more American. In the evaluation of university faculty and departments, I have the sense that the UK is very much in the lead in the quest for criteria that do not encourage anybody to know anything about what they are judging. <laughs> and there is no fog over the channel to isolate the continent. <laughs> I've been trying to keep my cliché quotient in, in some kind of check. You'll notice that I have not until now uttered the word neoliberal. But I might conclude with a few reflections on another timely word in the current economy, uh, the indicator, uh, along with uh, benchmark. These are key words for history and social studies of quantification and statistics of information, evidence, and data. Well, so just uh, here, here's how the writer Lee Hunt introduced his literary miscellany the indicator in 1839. There is, he says, a bird in the interior of Africa whose habits would rather seem to belong to the interior of fairyland, but they have been well authenticated. It indicates, that is this bird, it indicates to honey hunters where the nests of wild bees are to be found. It calls them with a cheerful cry, did I, by the way, I put this in here, I did, sorry, there it is. It calls them with a cheerful cry, which they answer, and on finding itself recognized, flies and hovers over a hollow tree containing the honey. While they are occupied in collecting it, the bird goes to a little distance where he observes all that passes, and the hunters, when they have helped themselves, take care to leave him his portion of the food. This is the cuculus indicator of Linnaeus, otherwise called rock, the cuckoo, or honey, or honey tree. But Hunt's magazine, like the bird, was to lead the reader into a garden of literary delights and temptations, hence you could call it indicator. His natural history was in fact not at all. I, I read this, this. I thought, as he said, we would think this is a mythical story. I went to uh, the website Avabase, and uh, which confirms uh, more or less what Hunt uh, reports. Uh, the bird was in fact uh, found, uh, identified by a student of Linnaeus, Andres Sparman, uh, who described it in uh, 1777, based on his observations in southern Africa. The Dutch settlers already knew of these birds, calling them honey guides, or honey geyser, or tuning geyser, and long before them, the Khoisan and other African peoples. Although these reports of the honey guides' astonishing behavior are accepted by modern <coughs> science, the bird seems to inhabit a world of natural theology or of divine semiotics, far removed from social science. Yet African bee hunters, as Sparman reported, behave strategically in relation to their guides. They always left some honeycomb behind as a reward for the bird, but never enough, he says, to satisfy its hunger. The bird's appetite being only whetted by this parsimony, it is obliged to commit a second treason by discovering another bee's nest in hopes of a better salary. The bird is cunning in its own way, not only by enticing humans and badgers, who seem to be the you know, and to, to, to have made possible this behavior uh, later with humans, uh, uh, humans and badgers, to assist in robbing the bees, but also by laying her eggs 
in the nest that the, 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 the indicator lays her eggs in the nest of other birds. This is why the travelers called it the cuckoo and why, but one more reason why it was so fascinating to natural history and uh, literary authors uh, two centuries uh, and a century and a half ago. Etymologically, an indicator, like an index, has to do with pointing. Logically, indicators uh, detect, point, detect, point, or measure, but do not explain. The quantitative indicator, in contrast to the verb, uh, often cannot pick out the very thing of interest, but in its place, something whose movements show a consistent relationship to that thing. Since its purpose is merely to indicate as a guide to action, ease of measurement is preferred to meaning for depth. The allure of big data is not just about abundance, it is about vast repositories of information that can function as indicators or as evidence. The extraordinary availability of data and information enables all of us, in, in effect, to carry around a vast library. And since I am, you know, probably seem to, you know, most of my talk is in a kind of skeptical, ironical vein, I do emphasize the extraordinary opportunities as, that, that, that data provide us as well. But much of, of it, the data, um, but, um, some of the data means uh, nothing, and the rest usually points uh, without proving. The little spaces between indication and truth are not trivial. They are spaces of exploitable ambiguity, and, they are, and there are powerful forces making them wider. This word data stands for the rawest and most voluminous kind of, uh, of source uh, material on the empirical world. It accumulates in semi-autonomous fashion, in, uh, as is happening now, hello. <clears throat> in semi-autonomous fashion, and, and often is processed automatically. Some people want to turn themselves into, into computers, a peculiar uh, pursuit of self-alienation. Uh, but that is not my issue here. It is that the processors, with all their terabytes of power, or am I over to my three, you know, three, three zeros, the short, uh, with all their terabytes of power, um, uh, are very slow-witted. They miss the point and are outmaneuvered by cunning humans. Little inaccuracies of indication can be magnified into terrible misdirection and get us uh, nowhere near where we want to go. It may be a while yet before we can give up on uh, thinking and interpreting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Time for uh, questions, uh, guys, or uh, please. Yeah, I, I wonder. Uh, a famous uh, philosopher called Gregory Bateson. He said that the map is not intelligent. So, with all these Europe uh, data, are we running the risk of mixing the map and the real territory? If there is such a thing as the real territory. <coughs> You know, there probably is a territory. Uh, we were just this, uh, this wonderful, uh, you know, uh, Borges story of the map, which the Peruvian emperor or something wants to extend over the whole territory, until it, which, uh, which you know, you know, provides a justification for, uh, in, in one mode, for saying, well, you know, in the end, our models simplifying has some legitimacy after all. Though Borges goes even farther and you know, says, well, and then. The, map kind of dissolved. The people that neglected the map and it dissolved and now nobody knows which is the map and which is the territory because it just shreds the map covering this, covering this territory. Um, um, you know, we never actually, that is, we experience the territory only partially. By now, we can only experience data. I mean, at least the, the, the real, real databases can only be experienced very partially. We develop whole strategies for searching the, searching the data as well, the great, um, well, you know, it, it, you, you, the English know this uh, very well because, yes, Minister, um, the, 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 the minister first keeps the, 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 uh, the, um, the, the uh, member of Commons from knowing anything by keeping all the data out and then filled his room with boxes. And the U.S. cigarette companies uh, did that thinking that they would keep, nobody would be able to learn anything. And in fact, the search engines, they found all this cool stuff which has become and embarrassing. I mean, we're all, you know, in some way, you know, we're always occupying this in between space. Um, and I'm going to say that, I mean, as uh, you know, um, 
source of that, let's say, you know, cognitive <coughs> source of the data is always valuable, or, uh, but, well, not all data is valuable, but typically data is valuable, it's all valuable for something, and we do need to know what it's, what it's valuable for, and um, I'm going to say that, you know, since uh, Bates is the anthropologist and, uh, and the philosopher was, um, you know, already the, you know, the confusion of our models and so on, and the, and the things we're trying to talk about was a, was an issue, and we never really avoid that, and uh, we just need to be interested. In, we need to be interested in the in the processes of data generation, and actually all the processes by which we do science or or or, or, or scholarship as well. We need to keep that bit of ironical distance, even even as we you know we move beyond it. Some more questions? Kirsten? Yeah, uh, it's a very interesting talk. Uh, I just wanted to question your sort of uh, implicit assumption that there will sort of be in the future, in the near, maybe even distant future, be a room for human ingenuity. Can we not say that, that we may have reached the point where we codify and embed uh, the, the mere act of, of, uh, of interpretation in simplified interactive algorithms that then package and black box at several layers deep uh, um, interpretations that then render them invisible to us and therefore we lose we lose uh, any intuitive uh, mark you know if you look at the, the national health system in the UK or even the schools if you if you look at the amount of data that's produced and, and the way it is then presented and simplified if our if our intuition is one that's shaped exactly by these statistics why why do you think we don't just take them for granted? I mean, uh, the, the academic uh, gaming the Herzig factor, you know, is a good example. We should be the cleverest one, not falling for that simple trick. Yet, like small hamsters, we are running around like mad in this game that, uh, that we set up for ourselves. I mean, you have, in my view, a, a slightly too high hopes for humankind. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm going to take that as a friend of mine. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Wait. Just to kind of follow up on Carsten, in a sense, the critique, I, my question is, continues on. If, if we are going to continue to critique this, you fantastically eloquently critiqued a large number of statistics on the basis that we could understand them. We could kind of deconstruct the H-index and therefore critique it uh, and criticize it. And I just wondered how you could bring your criticism forward when we are unable to unpack those algorithms. We're unable to look at the complexity of multiple data sources that are put together to, in this idea of big data to produce something which has tangible impact on society. And I just wonder whether, you know, as these things become more black box, our critique is going to fail and therefore we're in a, a difficult position. Well, um I mean, that's a danger, and it is, you know, I, I very limited, uh, you know, way, uh, with my very limited perspective on this, it is what I'm trying to deal with. I'm actually, uh, I wasn't necessarily supposing that people would be, you know, uh, thinking I was too modest in my critique, so I'm happy to, I'm happy to hear that. Um, um, I mean, one answer is that reliance on, I mean, that, that is, not only as it were academic critics, if I may <coughs> assume that noble role, but I, participants are engaged in sorting out in, in seeking out the weaknesses of these things. And so the problems actually, it's not necessarily a good thing, but it's a necessary thing to be reminded. The problems will force themselves on us, perhaps. If the problems don't force themselves on us, then it's perhaps not, it's not as dangerous as it, it was. And then we end up with uh, partly mad as a taste. I'm the kind of person, for whatever reason, Perhaps that you, know, you understand me when I, you know, who uh, you know, refuses to to be guided around by my cell phone. Actually, I don't have one at the moment, but uh, because uh, I always want to know, I want to have the map, you know, <coughs> in my mind. I sometimes would follow follow the follow directions, but I'm not happy without having seen, or you know, in this uh, on the Borgesian map, you know, where what I've been doing. So, and uh, it might be, uh, I would say. For, for my taste, there are intellectual reasons why we want to keep some, sometimes to be able to step outside the database and to approach the problem from another perspective. But so that, so that one issue is what do we regard as sufficient 
understanding and uh, the um, you know the idea that as we're feeding it into a computer and it churns something out and then we have the answer even if those answers work very well it might leave us dissatisfied okay, so that is one kind of answer the other kind of answer is uh, is um, you know uh, are, are there ways I, so I say there are ways that people in fact take advantage so far take advantage of these of these very complicated machines they find there they exploit their uh, their problems and their weaknesses and their ways in which they can't represent and uh, and you know you patch up patch it up behind but there always will be well I think there will always be more I can't speak for the you know for centuries hence but so far that's the case I always wondered I mean you know, take take such a thing as a very artificial the fascinating and very artificial world of chess which now the computers beat us you know beat every player readily I guess you can get one you know a little little thing like this it will win that would win a chess competition, but you actually you think about what went into the programming of that computer, it did not solve the problem from first principles. It knows every game that was ever played and such things. And I and what and where it went. And with that basis uh, on that basis and a lot of other very human, you know, decisions constantly being updated, uh, it plays extremely plays extremely well. But the people who have the program can do a lot with that as well. One could, you know, as it were, you know, that there's a game with rules and somebody sitting with Four hours, you know, four hours time. But if uh, you know, if uh, if the oh, if the people playing on the other side could get into the program as well, they would be beating the machine again pretty soon. And actually, someday, like the you know the competition between you know whatever European and Chinese or American or whatever and Russian you know computer programmers each trying to poison each other as well, you know the uh, we would have the the battle of the the battle of the of the chess programmers or the battle of anything. I don't think they will ever be. Invulnerable to the to that kind of manipulation. For that reason, we need to step outside and maybe sometimes just for something not even. I mean, as it were, not what the analysis. Uh, maybe sometimes we would rather have the to take it very simple. We'd rather have I mean, the table of you know the papers he wrote down the number of citations and have the H index. I say the H index is an excellent example of something that really. Contributes nothing except for misinformation, except for uh, misleading simplicity. But uh, um, other things, um, many, however, many or most of these things do contribute something. But we want to, you know, we're going to have different indexes, and we want to get around it and interpret them. So, I, you know, by I, uh, you can you can also see this this um, <coughs> defense of interpretation as also a little defense of my own business in the end. I like, uh, I was, uh, I was better at, uh, at mathematical sciences as a young person and then I moved to history and I you know, believe actually in the end in the kind of understanding that history brings. It isn't the only one. Uh, actually any field can possibly do that, but we need this. We need along with, we need to, you know, we need the little maps. Uh, we need sometimes to be able to move to look at the bigger maps or the, even the, what we call the world, you know, in relation to the maps. Uh, and that, uh, and then some subtlety is after all <laughs> necessary, even though something sometimes a lot of things we're happy to, to hand off to automatic answers that perhaps not the important, not the most important. Mm -hmm. You want to? I would like to know where around uh, the black box you think uh, regulation could or should be placed in, in order to protect us against arbitrary decisions or decisions of, uh, of exclusions? Should it be at the moment of the collection of data or at, at the moment of processing or at the moment of, uh, of the decision or uh, should we request to, to open source uh, the black boxes? Do you mean, do you mean uh, regulation in the generic way, or do you mean real, real, uh, the word, you know, state regulation of that? Not necessarily. Yeah. First, it could be legal regulation, but it could also be some sort of, of techno legal or governance or self conduct. I, I don't yeah. think for any kind of uh, yeah. regulation. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't set boundaries. You know, I wouldn't draw limits on that immediately. I really think, for instance, you know, if you're an economist doing, uh, you know, running regressions on data to, you know, it might be that enough, you know, you've participated in discussions and these have been evaluated and you're confident that, you know, you can deal with the data as they are for the moment, but we do need to be asking about the generation of data all the time. My, I mean, even, even the census-like data has its problems, as we all know. I could tell you stories about 
the U.S. Census, which again I know better, but uh, but every 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 census and every kind of counting has its limits, which could be trouble. We need to we uh, we do have access to that, and we sometimes need to ask about it. Um, but also the uh, the levels of aggregation. Some aggregations are simple, but um, a lot of aggregations are here. Actually, the, the aggregation that produces the phylogenetic tree actually does, has some complex assumptions as well as simple things. And like the chess play computer, in fact, doesn't it produces it automatically, but it assumes, assumes some things about the relation between the genetic variability that, the, that, the, that, the, that is picked up and the ordering in time. Those are perhaps plausible assumptions. But, but they, you know, we can, uh, you know, we can go into that. We can. This is what good modelers do. Try out what happens if you alter the assumption a little bit. Does the thing just, you know, alter a little bit? Is there a point where it blows up? How much precision do we need? So I, you know, in some sense, I don't really have a, I don't really want to say that there's something we would always leave behind. Though obviously, you know, you, you, you choose your targets when you're when you're inquiring on such a thing, and you can't you can challenge everything. And uh, sometimes, you know, you as it were, sometimes our intuitions lead us in perhaps useful directions, but oftentimes surprises happen out there, and then we need to ask how that happened. Um, so thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm just curious about your uh, um, your view on uh, uh, what we now call open data uh, initiatives. Uh, there's a, a, in parallel with big data, uh, uh, there's a lot of excitement about not only collecting big data, but opening it up to uh, to the public uh, so that they could do something with it. Uh, along with that, you know, I'm curious about uh, you know the the being able to define what is data uh, and what should be collected is an exercise of power. And perhaps part of this open data and this democratization of, of big data could mean that uh, individuals can be part of that process uh, so that mm -hmm. the data that would have never been collected can mm -hmm. be actually collected mm -hmm. and maybe perhaps that's, uh, that can change and shift uh, mm -hmm. this whole dynamic that you talked about. I'm just curious about um, Well, on the one hand, um, <coughs> I mean, it, 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 um, the relationship on, on opening of I'm sorry, I'm sorry, power and data goes in both directions. That there isn't just <coughs> one thing. Sometimes to be covered by the press is, is power, or to be, uh, as it were, opened up. Though I'm just going to say, not both. Almost all of us have some things we didn't want that much to be, you know, out for everybody to to see. Um, um, one reason why. Um, uh, institutions like universities, among the many reasons, but an important reason why they are uh, inclined to rely on things like age indexes, is that uh, it has become harder to get confidential information. And the confidential information is both infinitely subject to abuse, and has been abused, and yet you know, you don't get honest opinions without the confidentiality. So, and the, the so, um, you know, and the, that's, um, and um, in some way, you know, people people who are not uh, uh, engaged in very important public roles probably should have the right to keep some, even of the more you know, data kinds of data, and that's more, uh, you know factual, empirical, you know, numbered kinds of data should, should probably have some right to privacy, but the opening up of state and public, corporate, and even some private data to inspection by anybody who wants to look seems on the whole to be a thing worth, worth, worth being excited about and very important. And, um, you know, the sites of abuse are typically protected by secrecy. So I mean, the old, the old uh, naive ideal, which I sometimes uh, naive about, also that you know that you know the light of press coverage, the light of openness, is a threat to abuses. I believe that also. So I'm a little excited by open data. Yeah.
Yeah. Somebody different dimensions too. I was just, uh, uh, I, I won't say quite fighting, but with Elsevier about my university now wants us to be able to put our, as many do, to put our publications that done open access and, you know, a uh, university press that charges 20 pounds for a book probably deserves to have it protected for some years because they've done this service, but perhaps uh, <coughs> Elsevier charging 50,000 pounds for a scientific journal maybe doesn't deserve that, and we need to make, we need to, uh, <coughs> sorry, actually, meanwhile, they were slow enough that I think I can get my thing into, I haven't I even, it's public, almost published and I haven't even signed the contract, so maybe they're just doing the other thing, and, uh, and uh, you know, hoping that not, you know, not creating a precedent, they're not going to fight with me, and they're not going to create a precedent that they've, that they've accommodated me uh, either, but, uh, you know, I, so, um, you know, openness and, you know, accessibility for reasonable costs or no cost is, for most things, seems a very positive development, but, yeah, you don't want all the, you know, you don't necessarily want all the, all the, all the critical things that, that might, or any, every critical thing that might arise about you in the course of doing your work to be uh, a couple of sides either, so we need to protect it as well. Um, so, my, my, uh, one thing is, okay. there's a people that need to hear your question. Yes, yes, I'm going to speak up as a, as a start for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so, I was wondering if, uh, if you, if they, you are a discipline like history of what you do with history of quantification and history of numbers, in the near future, it's not also to go to maybe uh, need maybe not you but someone else to change also to extend the scope of the investigations to uh, biographies, for example, uh, because uh, uh, because beyond also the the, the the overview that you gave us of uh, of the quantification statistics in organizations and institutions. Now, what's, what's increasingly happening with the, with the diffusion of these uh, cheap computing equipment and applications of all sorts is that, you know, the quantified self and these kinds of things, yeah. uh, that people start really to produce statistics. We will see in our presentation of four organizations that then do something else with these statistics, but also they are a means for them to build a narrative about their own life. A sort of a mm -hmm. uh, uh, journal mm -hmm. uh, by which they, they can recount what happened in their life. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's organizations that are more or less explicitly trying to exploit these uh, means. So, all these software applications they are providing various means by which people can do this. And so, in this case, then the statistics uh, mm -hmm. are uh, not only then the production of objectivity for uh, a collective, an, oh, an open interest yeah, objective yeah, discourse, yeah, but it's yeah, also yeah. production of numbers for a solid look, sometimes. And in that sense, then, mm. but it still mm. would be some sort of uh, history of quantification. So uh, yeah, no, there are, um, um, this. Um, yeah, it has been noticed by people interested in you know, history and or social studies or quantification, maybe that, perhaps, that perhaps, perhaps you are one of those. That, People, or maybe you're just talking from outside, and uh, um, well, it's full of interest for reasons you both actually. I mean, in some sense, we all. I mean, the uh, the quantified self as such is a new development, but that people have judged themselves partly by a formed, you know, alliances and thought of themselves as kinds of you know, as it were, far flung, perhaps you know, impersonal or far flung communities based on certain quantitative characteristics that we might, you know, because we have some similar measure, we might find a, a, a commonality between ourselves, but that, that again predates the quantified self as such. It, perhaps it's accelerating this quantified self, and that I think you were saying, which is, that, you know, as we again stand outside it and say, what cunning, you know, we put all this, all our all stuff on Facebook that can be used to, to, target, to target us with ads, and the quantified self also is a, you know, becoming part, it is itself becoming part of the economy of, uh, of merchandising. So, but on, on that, oh, actually, I have, also I have a colleague who's interested in the way the 10%, uh, Alfred Kinsey, did studies of uh, the thousands of interviews on human sexuality and published two books, one on the female, one on the human female, and the uh, late uh, maybe early 50s, early and mid 50s, and the 10% figure, which is actually one of the number of figures he offered for the for, for the number of, for the percentage of people of males in this case who uh, you know were 
uh, somewhere along this spectrum were homosexual, and they picked up one of them, probably not the most complete. It's an interesting question. Why 10 rather than 4 or 37? But they picked up the one that became, you know, a marker of that is, there are a lot of us, and not only a few of us was the, was the point, and you can't, and so that actually there are many ways in which numbers function to, uh, to make uh, you know, groups of people and even individual members of those people, you know, legitimate or illegitimate, recognizable or not, so, and that, yeah, I would agree. Any other questions? Oh, many. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I start. Um, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, I mean, what, I'm one of those in, in industry who <laughs> loves to measure stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love uh, measures too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and me me measuring things is, uh, I think it's really wonderful to use it the correct way. But, you know, one thing that is sort of difficult is that. You could be so creative. You could come up with so many things to measure in so complex ways. And that's the problem. I mean, we use, if I'm a manager of, 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 a, of an organization, we want to sort of measure the different departments. And then we talk to the different departments uh, as part of we make, making the business plan regarding what is important here, how are we going to measure it. And I mean, then in that discussion, it's obvious that it's problematic to measure things because it could be misinterpreted and so on and so forth. But if you find one or two <coughs> key perform indexes or whatever you would like to call it to measure, and you talk to the participant, talk to the manager and, and the guys regarding the problems, uh, how data could be misinterpreted and so on. And then you ask the question, okay, is there, is there another better way to measure this? And if you find out, no, there isn't. Okay, let's stick to this and use it for, 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 for next year. So, so in a way, even though it could be problematic, if you involve the people you're going to measure in an organization and talk about it, talk about the problem, then I think, uh, you know, it's, it's a very sort of effective way of delegating <coughs> responsibility in organization. So that's my sort of industry perspective on, on, on that. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to also regard that as a friendly comment. That is, the month, that, that is, that is also, that imposed, that imposed number doesn't speak for itself. No. And that, you know, you are evaluating, from, let's say, both, from two or more perspectives, evaluating the suitability of this number and the, you know, I mean, the inaccuracies it caused or could cause. I mean, actually, it works a lot better if, in the end, they are happy with the attempt to be measured by a legitimate measure, though if things go bad or if there are opportunities, they may sometimes be trying to, you know, to, uh, to bypass the intent of the measure, which happens all the time. But that measures, you know, measures that are, you know, the simplifying of measures is invaluable. I, I completely agree. Um, we have to watch out and be doing that. Um, Try. <laughs> yeah. Um, Right. So. Yeah. Uh, what struck me thinking about the, uh, the record keepers and the examples you cited in the talk was it was fairly clear who was the kind of the data owner or the record keeper. Mm, yeah. And yeah, they were institutions and they inherently mm. had some responsibilities. Mm. Mm -hmm. And these days, complexity has increased. Yeah. Actually, where, where the data is generated and subsequently owned or derived. Uh, questions really around uh, yeah. are, are we in a position where we can look at the responsibilities of the record keepers now and uh, how those responsibilities should evolve? Um, you mean that the, that the that responsibility should be diffused? Right? Yeah, or already is diffused. Well, it is diffused. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah your, your examples. Mm -hmm. The asylum did best attempt to get accurate data that we could be confident. These days, because of the complexity of the ownership, and we, we have less knowledge about well, we have this confidence in that confident uh, body of data because it's too hard to different sources and combined in different ways. Mm, mm, mm. Um, I see what you're saying. Because uh, we, yeah. we can regulate institutions to a degree, 
but a lot of the, oh. a lot of the data is owned by individuals. Oh. I see. No, I can I can have ten right. ten emails with right. a bunch of different aliases. Right. Right. Uh, I once got a I this a long time ago, somebody sent you know, for whatever reason that all the history professors or something got this uh, this video and it had pasted on the uh, outside um, a little flag saying um, you know, call best video ever on the internet. Called on, you know, they called on the internet, best video ever was something like that. And that was, uh, it looks like, you know, so <laughs> everything, anything can be put on the internet, even then it was just funny to me, but so they thought this was a, so anyhow, I mean, the, you know, if we have a very open system, I don't think we're going to regulate it, as says we're not going to be able to take people off because they have, uh, you know, un, uh, unscrupulous websites, and I don't know what, you know, there's, there's lots of meta commentary on these things. Um, you know, the spontaneous, you know, tendency of people to find the best data it may not actually be present, but I don't know what, what there is to do, except maybe for certain specific kinds, it's possible to have some credible groups who are making that analysis and the rest of the time, maybe it's, you know, sometimes it's better for people to have false things out there as well than to to shut it down and to, in some way, the, I sometimes speak skeptically to economists, but they're right about a lot of stuff, and if you, uh, you know, if you make it, if, if it works as if everything has been checked, when it's never, when it's utterly impossible to have, you only, to, to check everything, or to have, even to have the authority who can do that, then you just invite people to be gold. So, uh, you need a few lies out there to, the people will recognize as lies to recognize that best video ever is, on the internet doesn't prove anything. So we should. And we do learn that, I hope. Yeah. We, we <coughs> look, looking forward in 200 years' time, we can wish a professor, a professor of history looking back at us. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, a thing like, a thing like, uh, like Wikipedia, which I have to say, you know, we, I, I consider one of our tasks now as teachers is to make people skeptical and that, you know, you know it has its processes. It's not, it's not wonderful. Articles, but you know, I guess if it says somebody was born in 1838, unless I have some reason, I tend to be willing to accept to take that. As a, I might if it's if it's very. If I'm going to put the the, the thing in my you know, something I'm publishing, I probably would look at a couple of other things. If I didn't have some other page, I would probably want at least a couple of people who said that or see if there's any. I was just trying to figure out who somebody said my Richard uh, Douglas said was actually Robert. So I went online and all the. Richard and Robert Gunglison, I find over and over, and eventually, I'm pretty sure they were father and son, but they're, anyway, <laughs> you can try to, we have our ways to try to figure out what's going on with this, with this business, and, you know, and we were like, in some way, that is a, that is a skill that a person has to have, you know, an educated person, has to, you know, we, we will all make mistakes sometimes, but we try not to make too many. And I think with that, we conclude this uh, session. Let's uh, close the session.